Welcome everyone uh, to the final evening of the Calumet Heritage Partnership's 21st Annual Calumet Heritage Conference. The goal of this year's conference is to highlight some of the diverse voices and stories that collectively tell the larger story of the significance of the Calumet region. Uh, tonight, we welcome, uh, hopefully soon, Ray Pitlan, uh, principal artist of the original history of the Mexican-American worker mural in Blue Island and contributor to the reimagined mural that was born from the original's destruction along with artists Ricardo Gonzalez, Erica Valencia, and Robert Valadez, who worked together along with Ray to bring the mural back to life. Also joining us is Jason Berry, former director of community development for the city of Blue Island, a former CHP board member, as well as the former board chairman for the Blue Island Arts Alliance, uh, which was the nonprofit partner that helped uh, make the, re the reimagined mural possible. Uh, journalist Jackie Serrato, who uh, documented so much of the process of the recreation of the mural. Uh, and my wife is around. Uh, she's currently taking care of the kids. Uh, Sarah Brown, uh, she's here as well, who uh, helped me produce the film that you're going to see tonight. Uh, we want to thank our organizational sponsors, Calumet Collaborative, the Field Museum, and Arcelor Middle. The Field Museum and Calumet Collaborative gratefully acknowledge Arcelor Middle for their support of programs in the Calumet region. This conference is a project of Calumet Heritage Partnership, and I'd like to thank my fellow CHP board members, the program committee, and all of the volunteers that have worked so hard to make our first virtual conference so successful. And one final set of thank yous to all the speakers, panelists, and attendees who have joined us during the conference. Uh, if you'd like to donate to this year's conference or purchase some Calumet Heritage Area gear, you still have a few hours to do so. We'll post a link in the chat throughout tonight's presentation where you can do that or you can visit the conference page at Calumet Heritage Area, at the Calumet Heritage Area website, calumetheritageareaorg um, The Calumet Heritage Area began operating more than a decade ago, created by a coalition of Indiana and Illinois-based individuals and organizations led by the Calumet Heritage Partnership, an Indiana not-for-profit not corporation. There have been more than 20 years of annual Heritage Area conferences with nationally prominent speakers. CHP partnered with the Calumet Collaborative and the Field Museum to expand activities and to pursue congressional designation to become a national heritage area. Together, we have accomplished a lot to lift up the Calumet region as a place of national significance. Uh, tonight, we're going to screen a short documentary my wife Sarah and I produced about three years ago on the rebirth of an important work of art on Blue Island South Side, the history of the Mexican-American worker mural. Years after the original mural was painted over, a small group of people came over or came together to bring one of the artists responsible, uh, Ray Pitlan, back to Blue Island to help direct the installation of an updated, reimagined work, incorporating local artists and members of the community surrounding the mural. Following the film, we'll talk with our panelists about their experiences with the mural, uh, their work beyond it, and we'll field questions from our online audience. To submit a question for our panel, please use the chat function in your Zoom window. Uh, before we start the film, I just want to thank everyone who made the rebirth of this mural possible uh, beyond our panelists tonight. I think it's important to mention Iro Frausto, Laura De Los Santos, Tina, the building owner. I'm not sure if one of our panelists, maybe Jason could help me with her last name. <laughs> no, Jason, do you know her last name? <laughs> I, I, <laughs> it escapes me too. Okay. <laughs> Everybody knows Tina. It's Tina. Tina, it's Tina. <laughs> and, uh, and if I'm missing anyone else, Jason, uh, you can chime in. Do you think, can you think of anyone else I'm maybe missing? No, that works. I mean, it, what was so special was it was, uh, I mean, this giving away the punchline of, not the punchline, but the, I mean, it just brought so many people together. And like we said in the film, you'll see it, it was the exact opposite of the start. And so there's too many people to thank, but uh, I'm glad to see Erica and Rick and, and others again. You know, they're the heart of this thing. Yeah, for sure. Um, so beyond that, uh, you know, I'm so grateful we had the opportunity to, to make this film, to be able to document something that was you know, so important to so many people uh, with the original mural and to, to be able to be a small part of something as special as its rebirth. Um, it's not only a beautiful work of public art, but an extremely important one, as you'll learn in this film. Um, and, uh, with that, we'll start the film now. Um, after its, uh, upon its conclusion, we'll, we'll come back and 
I will we'll field your, your questions um, and uh, have a general discussion about uh, how this mural played a part in the lives of the, the artists and everyone that was a part of um, bringing it back. Uh, so yeah, I hope everyone enjoys it. And hopefully I don't screw this up too bad when I go to share my screen. And here we go. Especially in this today, you know, when we see what's happening out into the world, how important is is truth in art? Oh man, are we talking about alternate facts and all that crap? Uh, and, and freedom of speech. <laughs> well, I mean, truth is a funny thing when you're talking about art because you create imaginary worlds too. Art's very good at creating alternate facts. You know, it could do it really convincingly, um, and some of the best art is there to do that. I think it has to be understood that that's art and that's not propaganda and maybe that's when people like lose the distinction when they don't understand um, when they confuse expression with politics. <laughs> well, my name is Ray Patlan and I'm originally from the south side of Chicago, Pilsen, known as 18th Street when I lived there. I now live in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, spent a lot of years in San Francisco. Uh, I now live in Oakland in an old cookie factory that's been turned into a live workspace for artists. Yeah, I was, I've always been doing art since I was very young. I've been drawing and I didn't start painting until I was a little older, but uh, I was a little capitalist. I remember as a little kid drawing pictures and trading them with my friends for candy and toys and stuff like that. But, but my first inklings of public art were, became obvious when I went on summer trips with my parents to Mexico. And I got to see the murals of, of the Mexican muralists, which was a pretty astounding movement uh, out of the 20th century. And so I thought, well, you know, that could happen here. You know, and it did during the WPA to some extent. But, uh, you know, in, in the community in which I grew up in, it, it was a different set of rules. And so I thought maybe if I could create some similar expression in my community, it could have the same effect. Is there Yeah, the, the mural is called The History of the Mexican-American Worker. This was a mural celebrating um, Mexican-American immigration and labor and some of the rights that have been won over the last 50 years or more uh, in America and, and to celebrate sort of the growing Hispanic or Latino community in Blue Island. Uh, yeah, the, the mural was uh, first painted in the 1970s. Uh, Latin American Advisory Council and labor leaders got together to uh, create a mural here in, on Old Western and Broadway um, with uh, community members and, uh, and three artists, Ray Petlan uh, and, and, and two other assistants along with the community. When uh, painting first started, the city of Blue Island saw it as a, a challenge and was opposed to having the mural in this neighborhood. The day we were gonna start painting on the drawing of the mural, the city manager showed up and said, uh, you put one drop of paint on that wall, we're gonna have you, I'm gonna have you arrested. <clears throat> I said, well, why? He said, because you're, uh, you don't have a permit, first of all. I said, but you know, one doesn't really need a permit to do art. I said, you're not doing art. Next question was, 
from me was, what, what am I doing? He says, you're advertising. I said, what are, what are we advertising? He said, you're advertising your race. That's where he stuck his foot up his bazunga. Um, and so they stopped the work, um, declared it a sign, and told the artist they didn't have a sign permit. As I know the story, they went to get a sign permit and were denied their permit. And so they were sued. The city of Blue Island was sued by the artists, by the Latin American Advisory Council, um, and others to complete the work. And the lawyers came to me immediately. The ACLU, the union lawyers, they said, keep working. He doesn't have a prayer. So we continued painting and we took it to Supreme Court. And we won. Freedom of expression has set a precedent for public art in this country which not too many people know the significance of that act. Before the case was over in the courts, we had finished the mural. But anyway, out of all that mess, I left because I received a, a notice of getting a job at UC Berkeley in California. I didn't even have a BA yet, and they hired me to teach. I was really shocked, but I left. I packed up and left, you know, Chicago. and. Uh, then heard about off and on about the mural still having problems, somebody defaced it, and then one of the guys from the project was run out of town, his family was harassed, his house was, was spray painted and windows broken, and he moved to Arizona. He's still there. Over the years, being outdoor art, the work deteriorated, and finally the building owner de decided to cover up the work. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I remember when it, was, when it was being painted over, it was... Uh mid 90s i think it was like 90s 96 between 96 and 97 uh i was getting off of the school bus you know we're all getting off the school bus and we just saw two guys just with the white roller going over it and we we're just like what are you doing you know we just why we're just kind of like why are you doing this and it just happened and you know you know people just kind of shrugged their shoulder and then you know the mural was gone you know it was gone People kept contacting me by the internet, on telephone. Is, is the mural going to get redone ever? Are we going to see it again? And you know, people telling us to change their lives. And I, I didn't know it had such an impact on this community. And finally, uh, really led by uh, Jairo Frausto, um, got together a group of people at the Rock Island Public House and said, let's just make this happen. This can't be that difficult. Uh, Jairo, uh, organized us under this sort of banner, La Causa, which was the Creative Alliance Uniting Social Artists or something like that. Um, it sounded great after a few beers, and uh, we got going. I said, hey, it's time to do this. Let's, let's bring it back, you know? And it was, uh, you know, it didn't happen overnight, you know? It was a little bit of a struggle, you know, um, having the, uh, the owner of the building, you know, agree to, you know, giving us rights to, to do it. and. Uh, you know, that, that took some work and, you know, just over the, the winter, got the ball rolling with, you know, organizing the project and we rolled it out and an amazing thing happened. Um, you know, we were able to raise funding for it and brought the business community together, brought residents from all over Blue Island together, the city, you know, got the city uh, together and we made this happen. You know, it's kind of the, the, almost the complete opposite of what happened when it was first erected. Um, you know, and originally uh, the goal was to redo it exactly how it was. When I received a call from Hydro about three months or two months ago, uh, I immediately said, yeah, sure, you know, if you got the resources, I'm willing to go and work it. But it won't be the same mural. He said, no, we want the same mural. I said, I'm not gonna re redo something I did years ago, you know, and even if it was controversial and, you know, we have permission now. Yeah, I, I'm a, I've grown as an artist over the years. The people I'm gonna work with are not the same artists. It's obviously gonna change. There was a struggle for a little while. You know, it kind of opened it up to, you know, hey, you know, it's, let's keep the nuts and bolts here, but, uh, you know, if you wanna get creative with the artists that you're working with, 
and it happened. I don't see my work as only painting murals anymore. I see it as kind of orchestrating them. And so one of my primary concerns in doing murals now is community involvement and getting the community to feel ownership. It's not just protection for the mural, but it's also a really good spirit for the mural. The wall had been uh, acid washed and blasted to, you know, um, to kind of bring back as much of the mural that may have been left underneath the whitewash. And for a while, actually, you could see a good amount of the original mural. There are really neat images of, uh, of that sort of decayed mural sitting underneath there. Yeah, it was quite something. You know, it was dark. You know, we had to wait for it to get dark. We, the projector was turned on. You know, you saw the old image on the wall, and it was kind of like, wow, look at it. Can it, can it just stay like this the way it is now? And, but it was fun. People came out, um, started tracing the wall, you know, got a sense of ownership of the, of the, the new mural being... Uh, redone and it was it was it was exciting seeing that happen. Uh, I know I got a chance to jump up on a scaffold because I really wanted to uh, paint part of the eagle really bad um, and so I was up there one day. You know these, these young guys who work with me uh, on this mural on the forbidden mural I think at first thought I was too laid back and maybe even lazy, you know, because I wasn't doing anything. They were doing all the work. But the reason was because I, I really wanted to sit back and let this happen. And I wanted them to be the creators of this mural because they're from here. And I thought they should be the authors. Uh, you know, it was really an honor to work alongside Ray because, you know, he has so much experience, you know. So, you know, to, just to, to be alongside someone who kind of started the precursor for, for what we've been doing, you know, it's just, it's, it's pretty huge. It's really inspiring. Um, I think the mural overall, just the experience of it helped me with my own identity as an artist. And I feel like being an immigrant child, um, sometimes you grow up with like two very different cultures. You're, you're at home and you're, you're Mexican at home and then you're at school and you're American. And that can be really confusing for a kid growing up. And you grow up without a sense of true identity. And I feel um, like this mural can help not only me, that's, that's a little selfish, but like children, like mm -hmm. see themselves and see their families there. And I mm -hmm. think that's very special. This is a, a large community of you know, diverse people, but there's definitely a huge Mexican-American um, population here in Blue Island. So, you know, as children are going up, they're going, you know, this is something that's, you know, really uh, reinforcing and really, really comforting and really uh, knowledgeable to them. Representation is important, and I mm -hmm. think this mural does great things for representation. And I know the artists were very open about, you know, keeping the community involved as well. So if you showed up on any day, you'd probably be put to work. Um, if you wanted to. There are a lot of parents who would bring their kids, a lot of parents remember the original mural, bring their kids to paint, and I thought, mm -hmm. I thought it was great. Yeah. It was like just getting children, I mean, they probably don't know what's going on, but mm -hmm. I'm sure when they grow up, they'll, they'll remember, I painted this, I painted this grass, who we'll painted the grass <laughs> yeah. on Haido's kids? Yeah. <laughs> they were painting grass. Ray wanted to bring some elements that were missing from the original mural, and I think some of the artists also wanted to make sure that, um, you know, they left their mark on, on the mural as well. Someone had written a letter to him uh, years ago, letting him know how much this mural meant to him growing up, you know, made him f feel proud of who he was and his heritage, and they built this relationship. And uh, there's a, a pro portion of the mural that has a steel worker there, and that same steel worker was repainted there, but the face was changed. So it's the face of uh, Juan Cordova. So. You know, he got put in the mural too, and you know, I'm sure that's got to be an awesome feeling. Elements such as uh, the boxcar camps that um, were in Blue Island and were important for the Mexican community here. Um, they weren't in the original mural, but they found their way into this mural. Um, there's uh, community leaders such as Reverend Peter Contreras, um, the building owner, Tina, found her way into the new mural, and uh, I think, I hope I got, I think Robert Valadez painted her portrait in the mural. And uh, 
he painted her as she is now, and she's an older woman, and she didn't like it. So she came out with a photograph of what she looked like in the 50s, and he changed the, uh, the, the, the portrait. So it's a little bit like younger, uh, sexier Tina, I guess. Um, yeah, there were, there were some changes, but the story is still the same. It's a story of, um, you know, labor and work and success. The nice thing, too, is it has all these different signatures of so many people that contributed to the project. And, you know, for the people that are curious, you know, they could go and look up those people, see who they are in the community, you know, how they're involved. Maybe it's a relative. Um, and it's another source of pride, too, you know, for people to be, like, able to see, like, oh, like, there's so many different people involved. A lot of them, you know, are from the neighborhood, and you know, it, it's it's very it's it's right there, almost as if it were on paper. A story is a story, and history is a story, and we read stories across cultures and across generations that speak to us about struggle or speak to us about moving to a strange place and speak to us about success, and those are universal stories. So um, I'm glad that it celebrates um, a particular story, but there's universal truths there um, about, um, you know, becoming an American. Talk a little bit about that day and what happened. Uh, you know, it was just a, it was a, the end of the project. It was a, it was a great moment um, being able to, you know, let the community know the mural is up, it's here, but this is how it happened. Yeah, it was, you know, the weather was great. We blocked off the street. Um, you know, it was kind of like the same. There was some pictures back when it was first painted. You know, it showed the whole crowd out there. And just seeing that again, you know, it's just, it's just like, wow, you know, all the people that came out that cared about it or remembered it or wanted to, you know, be a part of this, this, this event. It was surreal that day. Um, I just, I didn't expect so many people. I know, I don't know why I wasn't, ex I wasn't expecting such a turnout because we had, People every weekend, week the weekends where we had so many people show up to paint mm -hmm. and just talk, mm -hmm. and so, but seeing it at the end, just everybody come together, it's like. One of the neat things about the um, uh, the, the dedication ceremony, it's a small thing, but they had two cakes there, um, came from La Dolce Bakery down the street, and uh, one of them had a, a photograph of the old mural, and one of them had a photograph of the new mural. He, it was just time, or not time, but it was just the perfect amount of cake because when the, the, it was all said and done and everybody was left, there was only one piece left. And I don't know who ate it, but here, like, yeah, come on, you just got to have to eat the last piece so I don't, nobody has to throw it away. And so just the, the difference in appreciation for the, that it was like you shut the block down and had a celebration with cake and, and the mayor and speeches, uh, a very different approach. Um, but still one a little bit rooted in what happened in the 70s as well at the end of the, uh, at the end of that event, they had everybody go up and touch the mural. Father Car Carlson, Ken Carlson came out uh, to do a formal blessing of the, the mural at the end. And that was something that happened in, in the 70s as well. There's a photograph of the community walking past and, and, and putting their hands on that mural. So try to have a little nod to, to, well, to those people that fought for the mural. Um, now they get to come back and hopefully just celebrate the mural. Yeah, that's it's kind of cool seeing that image. You know, you, you see this from the '70s, and then you see this 2017. It's just history kind of rewritten again in the, in the same way. In my role as you know, planner and economic development and community development, all those things, um, and this is a point that Hiro made too, as we talked about this. You know, I, I think it might show up on the La Causa page. One, we want this to be project number one. We think it was the most important mural project for Western Avenue, but not the only one. We're willing to see what works, what's obtainable, <laughs> and then, you know, from there kind of, you know, go on and, and do whatever projects, you, you know, people want to do here in the neighborhood. I think when you're starting off like that, nothing is too small. We hope that La Causa continues to be a player and that the Blue Island Arts Alliance continues to be a player and sort of a curator uh, and really look at Old Western Avenue as an outdoor gallery. And so you're selecting artists from the community as well as bringing artists in from Chicago and eventually, hopefully, internationally so that you create this sort of outdoor museum of, of mural and street art. What is the biggest takeaway that you would want the community of Blue Island and the surrounding communities to have from that mural? Well, I want people to understand that, um, you know, that history, the history of the Mexican-American worker in 2016 was wholly embraced and loved and hugged. Um, 
and I want people to know that um, you know Old Western is sort of on that march of history, and you know this is just sort of the start, and there's going to be a lot more to come down there. You know this this town was built by many people. You know, German, Irish, Italian, African American, Mexican, and yeah, the mural does depict you know history of the Mexican American worker, but every Buddy in this town, you know, we're here to get along. We we all get along, and and uh, no matter what's being painted, it's the sense of ownership of someone saying, "Hey, I was a part of that." Definitely uh, um, helps preserve it, helps promote more projects, and people care more about their town. I, I definitely think. All right. Um, so that's that. Uh, so we created that film as um, as part of a, a larger campaign to to tell the stories of Blue Island, to shed some light on the history of Blue Island, and uh, really to help market uh, our hometown in the best way we knew possible. Um, and Jason, who's joining us today, was actually you know the impetus behind all of that. Um, and what started as a Facebook page um, grew into this film series and uh, ultimately led us to volunteer and serve uh, Blue Island in so many different ways in just a matter of the last four or five years. Um, but I just want to publicly thank Jason Berry for uh, turning us on to uh, what was a different film series for a different uh, locality in Illinois. Um, that really did inspire us to, um, to start this film series, which led us to do uh, that film on uh, the history of the Mexican-American worker mural uh, in both of its forms. Um, so I was unable to get Ray uh, on the phone. I'm not, I don't think he's going to be able to join us tonight, but we do have uh, Jason Berry, as I mentioned, uh, and Erica Valencia, Robert Valdez, and Ricardo Gonzalez, um, and all of them worked on what was that uh, reimagining of the Mexican-American worker mural. Um, and I don't think I see anything in the chat question-wise, unless I've missed something. Um, yeah, I guess I'll, you know, I'll start with... Um, there is a question in the Q&A. Um, oh, oh there's a, that's right, there's that. <laughs> um, and she's asking, how is the mural maintained and who's responsible for the upkeep? <laughs> what I remember is, um, I think the, the city of Blue Island is, or the Arts Alliance, uh, maybe jointly. I think we put an easement on on the uh, on the wall, so uh, there's an easement granted to uh, the Blue Island Arts Alliance so that it could be maintained. So I think that was part of the back and forth with the property owner, um, and that's not uncommon for murals. Um, you'll you'll see that, so you could. Uh, Sometimes it becomes a tricky issue when somebody goes to sell, you know, they might not want to sell property encumbered with an easement, but I believe that was how that was done. Um, fortunately, it, it still looks good. Um, but uh, I would definitely, you know, you know, the artists probably have more experience with uh, the challenges in keeping these up. Certainly we it got repainted because of that. Let's see, I'll pick on Robert because I saw he, he took his, his, his himself off mute, which means he probably has something to say. and. I, Rick and Erica, you could turn your cameras back on and jump in because uh, when Kevin asked me to be a part of this, I first said no. I was like, no, nah, you need Robert and Rick and Erica. And he's like, well, I got them. And then I'm like, okay, I'm in. I'm in. <laughs> I want to hear their stories, not mine. Well, certainly about the, the lifetime of a mural. Uh, uh, with acrylic paints, you're talking about maybe 20 years of uh, pretty strong color. After that, you get some painting. Of course, it depends on the... Uh, uh, what uh, direction the uh, mural is facing? Also, if it's uh, in direct sunlight, you're gonna get more uh, more fading, and uh, if it's under you know shaded conditions, less, and that sort of thing. So, um, I think uh, you're only a few years in with this new mural, so I'm pretty sure it's still vibrant. Yeah, I think just uh, looking at it, uh, you know, here and there throughout the throughout the years, uh, it's it still has that rich color. Um, so yeah, just like Robert said, it uh, it's more than likely gonna have a good twenty years still to to keep going. And I remember we did use like a, I believe we used a sealer, um, 
I can't remember exactly what it was called, but that definitely will help preserve it. Yeah, also, yeah. We, use, uh, we also we use Nova Color, which is uh, out of California, uh, a, a mural paint that's uh, well known for its uh, for its uh, permanence, and um, uh, a mural artists use it from from all over. So it's real good stuff. So we have uh, a couple questions from uh, David Klein, who's actually on the CHP board. Um, do you guys remember offhand or know when the when the original mural was painted? That was 1975, from what I understand, okay. uh, from what the, uh, Ray told me, and that even uh, it even came out in a book called uh, "Towards the People's Art" by uh, John Pittman Weber, who's a muralist in his own right and uh, um, an academic, and he uh, wrote a book uh, back in the 70s uh, regarding that mural in particular. Uh, as because it was part of a, this particular court case uh, where the, uh, the, the the city of Blue Island uh, had a uh, the city fathers whoever they were at the time had a little bit of an issue with uh, the content of the mural and they were trying to say that it was uh, uh, advertising at some level because it had the uh, United Farm Workers symbol on it which I guess advocates uh, it, it symbolized something to them that they weren't too comfortable with, and uh, uh, so uh, they wanted to paint it over. Uh, the city did, and then uh, somebody or another got a lawyer. And uh, it's a big, long story, but it it went all the way to the uh, the state level, uh, to the state supreme court, where it won the case, and it, it ended there. It didn't go to supreme court to nationally, just uh, just to the state, and um, it set a bit of a precedent in terms of uh, public art. And uh, uh, you know murals in general about where they uh, where they stand in terms of the First Amendment and and it's um, uh, it's uh, it, you know, where legally uh, public uh, imagery in the public square where it where it stands legally and uh, so it, uh, it set some sort of precedent this mural did yeah and I'm I'm curious. Um... You know, uh, maybe start with uh, with Eric and I, I, Erica. I know you guys, you know, kind of touched on a little bit in the film. And I, you know, forgive me if I maybe probably maybe edited some stuff out for the sake of uh, the length of the film. But um, Erica, if you could maybe uh, and Rick uh, touch on you know what what the mural participating in that reimagined mural, you know, what that what that meant to you. And obviously, Robert, you know, when they're done, I'd like to hear your uh, thoughts on that too. I feel like um, there so much has changed since we painted a mural um, politically and just in the world, but I think it stays, my stance on it is the same as an immigrant child. Um, it's, it, I want to say it gave me like a sense of who I am. I mean, even though I'm not, I'm not a kid anymore, but it, um, it definitely helps with that. Like I mentioned in the film, it's, it's a struggle with your identity, um, when you're growing up as an immigrant and as I said, um, the way things are politically right now, it's a struggle as well. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I can definitely connect with Erica as far as just like, you know, having, having that, uh, you know, like uh, representation and being, being a child of immigrants too. Uh, I, I, you know, I think it just hopefully reinforces identity to, to a lot of people. Um, I, I also really believe that just some of the amazing things about the mural that we worked on together was just the memories that were made by just people in the neighborhood people participating, people who got to paint on it, people that came out to, you know, talk, people that, you know, maybe came out to give us like some, you know, like water or soda or something, you know, <laughs> you know and just uh, or would come out and have lunch with us or, you know, things like that. So I, I think it just, it brought the community together and uh, hopefully it's just one of many things that does that. Um, but just, yeah, a, a lot of sense of pride that it's, it's clearly, you know, a Mexican American mural. 
but it, it, it should be noted that it's very much in keeping with uh, the, tr the tradition of uh, community-based mural painting, which uh, has been going on in various communities uh, throughout the country and obviously throughout the world. And we got a lot of our inspiration uh, from the uh, murals of uh, East Los Angeles uh, back in the 70s, uh, where uh, the, that was kind of the impetus and then it spread uh, all over the country. And in the Midwest, um, you know, particularly in Chicago, that were where I came up in the Pilsen community, we did a lot of murals. Um, that's where uh, Ray Potlan got his start. And when I was a kid, I saw his murals and he inspired me. And then later generations, you know, like uh, Erica and Ricardo here, younger people have uh, taken it up and it's a continuing conversation. And I think it's important that it's, uh, it continues and that uh, new voices come in and uh, add new uh, ideas, new concepts as we, as we progress, you know, socially and politically as a, as a community. It's important that uh, uh, we take on new issues and new subjects, and then and expand the uh, the language uh, thematically, visually, all kinds of different ways. Uh, in the '80s and the '90s, you had a lot of people coming in with uh, um, spray paint and all this, and that uh, was important. Also, it added to the conversation. So um, it's a con it's a continuing, um, evolving art form, but uh, the, the main important thing to remember, and, and this is what I think differentiates it a bit from what people consider street art nowadays and things like that, is that the community, uh, the, the idea of community-based mural painting is a dialogue with the community and um, the idea of participation of the people and um, uh, the community at large and having them be part of the process so they can take ownership of the, of the imagery and also that it reflect the, the concerns of that community. So um, you, know, you have a lot of, uh, of what they call street art nowadays and a lot of it's good, uh, but I think it's a bit of a different phenomenon. It's more like personal artistic statements, which are fine, but uh, we should keep an eye on, on, uh, on the, the, the idea of community, community uh, based mural painting as a tradition that should be uh, continued. And uh, I'd like to see more of that. And I'm actually seeing more of that, uh, particularly uh, this year with the volatile, volatile uh, political climate, you see a lot of stuff. Uh, there, were, there was all kinds of unrest in the streets and uh, they were boarding up all these buildings. Uh, there was rioting going on. But on, on the plywood, you start seeing these spontaneous murals. To me, those are beautiful. The idea that uh, they are, came up organically from people that were responding to the situation around them, you know? So I think that's a, a beautiful phenomenon. And I'd like to see more of that. Mm -hmm. um, I have a couple of questions uh, in the Q&A. Um, so our friend Mario uh, Longoni is asking, uh, were there specific industries in Blue Island that particularly attracted Mexican Americans? Um, I want to say, uh, I want to say initially, like, uh, and it's represented in the in the mural. Um, <laughs> get it, yeah, get it, Jay. <laughs> um, they the boxcar camps that were set up um, along the the Rock Island Railroad, um, and I assume probably well, I don't know about the Illinois Central, but the, the Rock Island for sure. Um, you know. Yeah, Mexican Amer uh, Mexicans immigrated to uh, to America to Blue Island um, and and set up these 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 boxcar camps. They lived in in, in boxcars alongside uh, you know the the railroads that they that they worked on. Um, so I think I, I I don't know if there are any other industries that you know, may have attracted them. I'm, I'm sure there are others. I could uh, talk about it. I could just try to get it in frame. It's you know, <laughs> the one that and and this is something thanks to. Uh, Cairo, who's not here today, he had these made for me and Mark Petoska and Miguel Salgado, who uh, were the four guys that were drinking at the Rock Island and decided we could do this thing, start raising money. Uh, but this is something to me that I'm very, very interested personally, like the history of the Traqueros, the uh, Mexican-American track workers 
who came up from, God, this is weird with me just sitting in the corner freaking everybody out. Um, but that history, you know, coming up from the, the Southwest and coming through the Rock Island, there are studies from Whole House um, and, and Jane Adams about, um, you know, the uh, Mexican camps. And they're not specific to Blue Island. If you know Eola, an old place name out by Aurora, it's still kind of out there. That was one. And um, there are, I believe, I think I've seen one, at least in, in Cal Park, documented that these things, you know, they were taking off the trucks, off the wheels, were taken off and turned into housing. And um, when I worked at the city of Blue Island, I was able to go through the birth records and found what I probably think was the earliest documented, um, you know, Mexican American birth in Blue Island. And it was in 2015, and they list where you were born, and it said Rock Island Camp. So these things were real; they really happened. I mean, there's photographs, and um, so that's something that I always thought was really unique history. And a lot of people that I've met, you know, uh, have connected to that. But there's other stuff in here. It's a very Calumet story, you know, with, with steel and the like. I don't know, guys, you know some of the faces that are in here. I could continue to hold it if any of the artists want to talk about any of these people, as long as you don't mind it wobbling a little bit. Well, I wanted, yeah. to, mention, uh, I wanted to mention about um, you're talking about the boxcars and people living in them. Uh, back in 1999, I painted a mural in Sterling, Illinois, which is about uh, 100 miles straight west, uh, uh, almost by the Iowa border in the Sauk Valley. And I did a mural there. And it was the history of the Mexican American community in, in that town. And uh, we painted uh, the boxcars in there because people lived in a, neighbor, a whole neighborhood. They call it Silver City because they painted all the boxcars silver to reflect the sunlight. And uh, I met a lot of uh, older people that had uh, grown up in, the, in that uh, place. Uh, see, because uh, at the time, um, uh, Sterling, Illinois was also, it was another uh, uh, steel town. They had a, a mill. And uh, I also point, uh, I, I painted in their mural one of those uh, molten bucket uh, things, uh, ladles, uh, I don't know what you call them. Anyway, the thing, yeah, like one of those. Uh, I painted that also in their mural um, as being part of uh, their history, uh, the, the steel mill and all that, and also the military uh, history, World War II. Uh, I painted some of the veterans in there and things like that, of that nature. And then also the agriculture, which was another area with, um, that uh, brought immigration from, uh, from uh, Mexico and Texas and stuff like that, which is uh, not unusual for um, uh, Mexican-Americans who have grown up in the Midwest. Uh, uh, my grandfather came to Chicago in the 1920s. He uh, worked in a metal foundry uh, his whole life, the same place. And, uh, he poured molten steel and all that other stuff, you know. So it's uh, not an unusual um, story in the uh, in the, so the, the the Midwest um, uh, sort of Chicano Mexican American experience. Uh, it's uh, you see it here um, in Blue Island, um, also in like I said Sterling there, but all kinds of places throughout the throughout the Midwest, uh, Wisconsin, Michigan. Wherever there's uh, Mexican Americans, you see very similar stories. Yeah, I I think also like just remembering some of the the portraits on the mural. Um, I mean, there were some that were mentioned on the on the video, like the pasture and uh, you know Doña Tina. Um, but there's one person I think in the center. I I cannot remember her name, but I think they had said uh, people in the neighborhood were saying that uh, she might have worked. Uh, at one of the old, an old factory that was in Blue Island. I'm not sure if it was like um, what they were actually producing, but uh, but I guess it was, you know, someone who was a, an elder from one of the factories uh, from the neighborhood. But it's just like, yeah, it just kind of passes me by right now. I cannot remember the person's name, but they're kind of like almost in the center of the mural uh, next to the, uh, next to the, uh, you know, the, uh, I, I can't remember if it's like a, a person in the army or, or the Marines, but there's like a, a person uh, right in the center of the mural itself too. Um, but yeah, there were also a lot of like symbolic imagery about an industry and really just the, you know, the blue collar, you know, workers uh, throughout the Midwest and, you know, throughout the U.S. 
So uh, some some were simply symbolic, and others I think were very specific people. Uh, like I know there was a Cesar Chavez who's on the upper upper left hand corner of the mural, um, and yeah, there's like two workers on the top. Uh, they, those were definitely symbolic people. I think they were substituted from uh, a pre other portraits that were there in the original seventy five mural. And uh, to Robert's point too about um, you know agriculture, I, I, I think not just in Blue Island, but the, the Calumet region as a whole. I, I think we do focus a lot on you know that industrial heritage. But I mean, speaking specifically from Blue Island, there was definitely this was a very there was a lot of agriculture happening in and around Blue Island, which um, you know can be seen in some of that industry, like the Klein Grain Elevator that was in the middle of town. Um, the, the Libby, uh, McNeil Libby plant that's, uh, still standing in some form, uh, in town as well, which I wonder if maybe, you know, that, that might be the factory that, you know, those guys were talking about that, that woman working in because I painted fit, I fit those jars, uh, in the, in the mural, I, I did all the jars on it. Oh, that. great. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, just to touch on that agricultural, um, comment for sure. Um, is there anything else you guys wanted to add to, to. To that that question there i'll just say you learn something new every day i hadn't noticed the jars before i yeah there they <laughs> are <laughs> good yeah, job yeah. we got the libby plant in there that's good yeah, yeah i painted that little bit yeah, right there the little people with the jars putting in the jars yeah that was a that was a day's work yeah <laughs> well the, the piece like that there's always a reason to go back and, and, and keep looking at it you know well, that, that's what I also, what I liked about this mural, a lot of murals that, uh, uh, you know, community murals is that they have, they evolve organically like that. Somebody will say, hey, you know what happened? This or that happened. And then well, what about the cans and the Libby plant? And then, then you put them in and then uh, people come up with, uh, you know, um, different kinds of ideas. Uh, you know, the guy with the big machine in the middle, he's, uh, he was uh, actually a, a real person from the community. They put his face in there and stuff like that and then the, the lady that owned the building um uh, yeah you know all that stuff uh it grows organically uh, as you're painting and i think that's one of the beautiful aspects of uh painting in the street and getting people uh, all involved and stuff it's, you, know, you get that kind of a uh that kind of participation which is good because it gives that community ownership and uh it becomes part of the folklore you know they'll they'll tell their kids Oh, I painted on, uh, on that back, uh, way back in the day. I painted on that, and uh, see that uh, we did that, and blah blah blah, and then it becomes this. The, it becomes integral to the community. This, 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 the image, you know. So that's a big responsibility, I think, to uh, to help them uh, express themselves in that way. We got Jason Barry as the Calumet Vanna White tonight. Thanks for that. It's helping out. It's a good idea. <laughs> um, so uh, moving on to uh, our next question here um, from, from Madeline Tudor uh, from the Field Museum. So many stories embedded in the mural and its revitalization, and it speaks powerfully to local experiences of immigrants and how those connect more broadly to what others are going through today. What would you like to see in future mural projects? Uh, I'll start with you, Erica, if that's okay. Did you catch that, Erica? Sorry, you cut off. Oh, did you I? You cut off a little. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, the, the question is, what would you like to see in future mural projects? Around Blue Island? Or in yeah, general? Yeah, I, I think that's, we'll, we'll, for the purposes of this discussion, yeah, we'll, we'll do that. <laughs> Yeah, what would you like to see in uh, for future mural projects in Blue Island? I think more history based um, would be nice or even just what's going on around the world right now. What do you think, Ricardo? Well, uh, definitely it's always just nice to see contemporary ideas and messages. Uh, you know, I know you know, Ray's mural from 1975 was a very contemporary message. So, you know, we all have fond memories of it now. 
So that definitely can bring upon the idea that, you know, current and current issues and ideas can definitely, uh, you know, be something that is a really a effective to the community. So I know there have even been like, uh, you know, uh, people trying to start out new projects. I saw that there was a really, really amazing mural on, uh, I think it's Vermont, uh, or Black Lives Matter mural. And it's on the side of, uh, of one of uh, the newer Mexican restaurants. So just seeing, yeah, just, you know, more, more modern ideas, uh, messages, uh, diversity, and, uh, you know, new voices too, like Robert said. Um, so just seeing, seeing other people participate, you know, just seeing, seeing other people bring, bring uh, ideas to the table and, you know, make things uh, exciting. Anything to add to that, Robert? Yeah, no, like uh, like uh, Ricardo was saying, I think it's uh, it's important that uh, community-based mural painting evolves and uh, takes on uh, new issues and new ideas. And um, uh, like I was saying this year, you saw a lot of that happening, very very grassroots uh, from the organically, and that's the way it should be. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, you see a lot of stuff in. Uh, well, certainly here in Chicago, you see a lot of um, fun and hip stuff uh, coming up. Um, you know, a lot of little sleepy bears and funny things, and they're cute and all that. You know, but uh, um, I think it is important to um, to to, like I said, continue that dialogue with the uh, with the uh, with the community, and not just in my community, but Blue Island or um, all throughout the Midwest and. Um, also, I might add that when they talk about uh, Chicano art and Mexican American art, there's a tendency to think about things in terms of the, mid, uh, the Southwest, and that's a lot of great stuff out there. Uh, but I think uh, our story, uh, Mexican Americans in the Midwest, is a is an untold story, mm -hmm. uh, and there's plenty of um, there's plenty. Of People that have been uh, doing documentation, uh, like yourself, for instance, and uh, but uh, you know a lot, in a lot of uh, academic settings. Uh, so the, the material is out there, but uh, it's, um, it's I think it's a, it's an issue of getting the word out that we've been here this whole time. You know, um, I know that like I, like I was telling you, my grandpa came to Chicago in the 20s, but there there have been Mexicans in the Midwest since uh, the turn of the last century. It's been it's been a long, long time over 100 years, you know, so uh, our story is uh, yet to be um, uh, told, I think. Uh, and, and the, it needs to be um, uh, put to the forefront a little bit more. I'd like to see more of that. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, I guess, uh, I don't think we have anything else in our Q&A here. Um, I'm curious. Um, you know, for for the artists, you know, what what was it? What did what did you uh, what did you gain from you know from working with uh, with Ray on on this you know particular mural? Uh, whether you know whether it's you know inspiration or technically or or um, you know or whatever. Um, Erica, if you could start. Being the youngest artist uh, working. I feel like I learned something from everyone. I worked closer with Ricardo. I feel like Ricardo and I were the ones who were there the most. Um, but definitely Ray, always stories, always every every change, as um, Robert mentioned earlier, it grew organically. I feel like we went with an, we came in to the mural with a general idea of what we were doing and then everything just started evolving and he just had a story for everything. Oh, add this because this happened. Um, but yeah, fun guy. Always had stories. Talks a lot. I'm surprised he's not here today. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I completely agree with Erica. Uh, you know, I, I, I have nothing but fond memories of Ray. Uh, stories were, were the best. Uh, but uh, generally speaking, like, he, he was also like a... Uh, is very warm and embracing of all the people of the community coming, stopping by and talking to us and, you know, pitching in. He would also encourage people to participate. 
Um, so each day was like a fun adventure to, to work with Ray. Um, and, and also like uh, uh, technically, you know, he had so much knowledge about painting because he also was like a professor, I forget at what school, but you know, he had spent years teaching art, you know, teaching painting, uh, you know, that on top of like all the murals that he had worked on throughout his life. So it was just a wealth of information and knowledge and experience that was just so valuable to, to us working on the project. And, uh, you know, and, and, you know, one of the great things about this project, too, is like, you know, it's called History of the Mexican-American Worker. And the process, I think, that, that we went through, because we did this probably in just about a, over a month, maybe like a week over a month, you know, it's probably about five weeks or so. Uh, it definitely felt like a labor project. You know, it definitely felt like we were workers on the project. I know we're artists and painters, but we felt like workers on the project. You know, we'd start at a certain time. We'd probably get there about eight o'clock or something, and we'd stay there till about sundown in the fall, you know, six or so. And uh, yeah, you know, we, we, we always set up our scaffolding, got our coffee, morning coffee, you know, uh, got to work, got our buckets and, you know, water, cleaned up our materials. And we always had to break things down, you know, in the morning and at, in the afternoon when we would uh, put things away. And this would include people stopping by on the shifts, you know, people stopping by, pitching in. Like some people would come by and they're like, all right, I got a few hours before work. Let me jump on and be part of the process. Uh, but a lot of that was from Ray. You know, he really set the tone of this community aspect to, to the mural project. And uh, it's hard to imagine that without him. So he, he just brought so much to the table. Well, you know, me and Ray go way back. Uh, first time I worked with Ray was in the 1980s, uh, the late 80s at uh, Benito Juarez High School in uh, Chicago. And I've had a, you know, um, and then I didn't see him for a long time. And then you know how you rediscover people on Facebook uh, years later, and then we reconnected. And um, and now uh, we talk all the time. And he'll call me out of the blue and complain about whatever Trump or this and that. Do you hear that guy? You know, you, you, just to call me for, you know, like, just to, just to rattle off, you know? And so uh, we're, 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 uh, we do that still often. We, uh, we, we talk by phone a lot. And, uh, oh, by the way, he taught at Berkeley. Uh, first, mm -hmm. he started out at Chicago State University in, uh, here in, in, in Chicago, and then uh, later on, he taught at Berkeley and uh, uh, San Francisco, and now he lives in Oakland. So, mm -hmm. he got priced out of uh, San Francisco, the Mission District, where he uh, lived for many years, is uh, being uh, taken over by Google and gentrified, and so uh, mm -hmm. he couldn't afford that no more. So he had to move, but he's in he's in Oakland now. Hey, uh, amazing portraits, by the way, Robert. <laughs> oh, thanks. Uh, some stuff I'm working on back there. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. They're backwards. Um, <laughs> uh, they should be the other way around. Yeah. I guess yeah, it's like is. a mirror, right? <laughs> like, a, like a mirror. All this technology, we can't and, and we can't figure out how to flip these things the, the right way. I don't understand that. I want to add, and, and this was at the um, the first fundraiser for it at the Blue Island Beer Company, and they made a La Causa beer, which was cool. But uh, Robert, you mentioned him earlier. A thrill for me was meeting John Weber, and I actually got to there as an auction, and I so I won one of his prints, and he signed it. And um, I was, I've been really influenced by his book. I'm not an artist, so as a guy who came at this as sort of a, I don't know, not an academic, but just as something that's interesting to meet a guy like John Weber and to have the Chicago Public Art Group involved. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that added a lot of credibility to it. Like we wanted to make sure like, this isn't a little thing. We're, we're bringing people that bring some serious heft. And Weber was around when the first one was painted. I mean, he, he was documenting it. We were looking at his book. Those were the best images. So, yeah, no, I, I, I love Weber. He's a great guy. I've worked uh, on murals with him too. And um, he's funny because because he's kind of a he's kind of like a, a, a reverse snob. Uh, he doesn't want anybody to know he went to Harvard and stuff like that, you know. And um, you know, I'm, I'm from the neighborhood, and he moved into Pilsen, and uh, he's a he's a, a a brilliant guy, brilliant guy. I love that guy to death. Yeah, uh, we worked together on several projects. Mm -hmm. Um, as as moderator, uh. I, <laughs> 
I guess I'm, uh, I think I'm pretty much out of, out of questions. Um, I didn't know if there was anything, um, you know, maybe starting with Jason, just, you know, wrap up with, um, you know, as, as far as your experience, um, you know, with the mural, you know, getting it off the ground, seeing it through and, and you know, what that, what it hopefully means, you know, for the, the future um, of public art, you know, in Blue Island specifically. I think, you know, a, a regret to start with the regret. It ends with this is going to be mural one. And I know, Rick, you got to do another one right down the street with uh, La Dolce and Rick and Erica and I were working on one for Western Avenue when they finally fixed the bridge and that's happening now. So who knows, maybe we'll get to put that mural on the side of the bridge finally. Um, and, I, you know, thinking about what Robert said as well, you know, the difference between community based mural painting and street art. I always kind of think of them as the same thing, but they are very different. And there is some street art down uh, Rock Island Public House now, you know, that tends to be an individual artist. And I'm not taking away from that. I love that stuff too. It's all cool. Um, but, you know, the, for the, the good part for me is honestly, I mean, it did start over a couple of beers and just people that said, we're going to do it. If we raised 20 grand in two months or so. And so if you got the right project, people are going to come together. September of uh, 2016, um, it was part of like Hispanic Heritage Month. And, you know, just hope, you know, if you got a project in your town that you want to do and it's the right project, like get off your ass tonight and start tomorrow because you could get it done. Mm -hmm. Well, I believe you guys, uh, you have some sort of a not-for-profit entity, entity, you know, that uh, deals with the, uh, the arts in your community. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's always good to have a not-for-profit in your, in your community. <laughs> well, you know, that, that's uh, how you get the funding and all that, you know, and uh, do the fundraising. Uh, I know that, like, like uh, when I did a mural in Sterling, they had something called the Sterling Mural Society, which, which would raise funds throughout the year for an annual mural. And they would do this uh, consistently. Uh, so if it's just a matter of organizing something like that and making sure that you have a goal every year. We're going to do a mural every year. And then, you know, you said about raising money throughout the year, various uh, uh, events and, you know, other initiatives. Um, and uh, you raise money that way. And uh, it, it takes a little bit of, uh, it's, uh, you know, organizing and uh, there has to be the, the, uh, the political will for it. But if you have that, uh, I think it's, uh, it's doable. And then you put it up on your, um, you coordinate with, uh, like anybody who's doing things in terms of uh, um, economic development or tourism, you coordinate with them so you can sort of be on the same page about that kind of thing and uh, work in, in, you know, in concert with them and, um, you know, uh, appeal to them that it's, uh, it's uh, beneficial for um, all aspects of your, uh, of your community, all segments of your community. And that's a good way to, uh, to uh, get enthusiasm for uh, you know, for uh, future mural projects and stuff like that. So, uh, yeah. We are lucky in, in Blue Island that we had somebody with the the foresight of uh, one Jason Barry to actually, you know, make public art a part of um, something from, you know, the from the governmental level, you know, locally. And we do have um, funding available um, through the Business Development District uh, tax that has been slowly accruing over the past several years and not a ton of money has been spent out of and i you know we're trying to urge the administration uh to you know to 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 kind of get that on their radar to you know to unfortunately not much success yet but um you know hopefully that's going to change you know pretty soon art art is economic development for sure you know i mean my role now and then, you know, working for municipalities to bring visitors, business, whatever. And, you know, at least for me as a visitor, nothing beats art, so. Mm -hmm. Also, uh, a good selling point to uh, potential funders is that, uh, uh, that uh, murals are, in terms of uh, public art and uh, public projects, they're uh, relatively cost, of, uh, cost effective. There's nothing, you know, it's a coat of paint, you know, it's, it's not like you're talking about, 
you know, big slabs of marble or anything that costs a zillion bucks, you know, it's, uh, it all it takes is, um, uh, you know, um, some paint and get yourself a, a few artists and uh, make the stuff happen, you know. So it's just a matter of uh, um, coordinating uh, these things. So, uh, you know, uh, a stress to potential funders or your uh, local business community that it's an inexpensive way to to brighten up the community and to get the people excited and uh, have them participate and stuff like that. And they, they, they'll usually bite when you talk to them in terms like that. You know? mm -hmm. No, you're right. Um, Rick, uh, you know, going back to the, the question that I had to, to Jason, do you need me to reiterate that or do you remember it? I want to make sure I get, you know, you and Erica. Um, oh, uh, yeah. If, if you could reiterate it. Yeah. <laughs> What did I ask, Jason? <laughs> uh, <laughs> now I'm having trouble remembering. Get my mind back on track. Was it like in general about like kind of uh, get the ball rolling on a new mural or new mur or projects like that or final? Or, or, no, I, yeah, that's right. Um, no, yeah, I just wanted to see if you guys uh, had anything to. I'm, I'm out of questions. <laughs> and oh, okay. I don't <laughs> Um, so I just wanted to see if there's anything that you, um, you know, wanted to to add uh, to, to tonight's discussion um, at all that maybe I didn't get to, you know, ask you a question about or, or touch on. Yeah. Um, well, you know, it was it was just uh, you know, for me, it definitely was a, a project that I'm extremely proud of. It's it's definitely one of the most, if not the most memorable memorable uh, mural to to have worked on. Um, but yeah, it's just like thinking back about like the fundraisers and everything it took to get the mural made, that, that was a marathon on its own, you know, and uh, there was a lot of great people that came together to make that happen. So early on, you know, everyone, you know, Robert, uh, Erica, myself, and other people were involved in the fundraisers. And, um, you know, I, I think that also helped us in, in painting the mural because we were, we were so, you know, proud and invested in the project. So like by the time we got to paint, we we already had the you know the the team spirit you know <laughs> to 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 make things happy to go and uh, do our best. And that that first night that Ray uh, came out to project the mural on the wall with Hiro and everyone else, uh, I mean I think that just did so much for the project because like you know, different community members came out and like maybe they wouldn't work, they didn't feel comfortable painting, but they felt comfortable coming up to the wall and tracing a drawing you know. And some of them, some of them are just like, oh, there's, there's like this big scaffolding. I just want to, you know, climb up there, <laughs> and, you know, take a selfie and, you know, and, you know, uh, you know, or, you know, some of them brought like, you know, their, their families and kids and everything. Um, so just so many great memories, like some of it really was just the making of it was, it was an amazing process. And I would like to think that just the community at large hopefully has those memories, you know? They can be proud of, a, of an amazing painting uh, that represents so much for people, but also that it left that lasting impression on the community at large. Well, I think in terms of future projects, uh, you, you got your guy, you got, you got your boy right there. You got Ricardo. He's from Blue Island, you know, so, you know, he'd be your point man in terms of uh, getting that enthusiasm going. I mean, I know you don't live there no more. No. <laughs> Yeah. I've been talking to Rick and, and, and Erica uh, here and there to, when I, as I'm trying to get things off the ground. I'm just, I keep running mm -hmm. into, into roadblocks. Um, and that, that discussion, <laughs> that's, tough year too. <laughs> that's, best, that's best head offline. That's, that's a lot of Blue Island politics. <laughs> but um, Erica, I'm, I'm curious uh, if there's anything that, you know, that you wanted to add that, like I said, uh, that I didn't touch on or didn't uh, maybe ask you about. Um, in terms of the mural and um you know what you want to see moving forward or anything yeah uh, well i just wanted to thank you kevin and jason for um facilitating the mural i had a lot of fun it was a great experience and i mean the funding is there i know we've been talking the funding is there the space is there we have a few spaces that um you had mentioned like i'm ready i'm not doing anything we're <laughs> With the lockdown coming on again, um, we have nothing but time, and I'm still here in Blue Island, so mm -hmm. ready when you guys are. Me too. No, I, 
And my wife's <laughs> clapping in the background. She's, she's excited too. Heard the going by when you were talking, Erica. I knew you were in Blue Island. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. It, it yep. passed by like three times already. I heard the same train. Yeah. In Sorry. Time. <laughs> um, yeah, but, uh, somebody asked a real, uh, an obvious question, but we forgot to say this. This is on Old Western in Blue Island. Yeah. yeah. Blue Island, south suburb of Chicago, but part of the Calumet region on the western fringe of the Calumet region. Um, you come down Western Avenue, you cross the beautiful Cal Sag channel, and then there's a little uh, sliver of what was Western Avenue before the uh, canal was enlarged. So you make your turn there and uh, head down to the corner of Old Western and Broadway. And it is on the southeast corner of Old Western and Broadway, mm -hmm. across the street from Mario's Tacos and Rock Island Public House. Well done, good job. I, uh, I didn't, I did not touch on that. But <laughs> that's an important detail. Um, glad, thanks for asking. Thanks for asking. I'm glad <laughs> we were able to share that. Um, yeah, one one thing I wanted to touch on with Erica too. I mean, I, I do think yeah, some of these. We, we do need some public art that touches more on the history of, of Blue Island. And, and there's actually some things that I have in mind for the Historical Society that I want to make sure. I mean, when when we finally get moving on that, you know, we're, we're doing quite a bit right now, as small of an organization as we are, we're, we're you know, we're, we're pretty ambitious. But um, there are some things down the road with something that I have a little bit more control over that I you know, want to make sure that I include you guys on. But, um, you know, like I said, we we're as the arts alliance um uh you know the chamber of commerce you know i, I kind of have my toes in that water too um you know we're we've talked with chicago public art group um you know we're we're more than interested interested we're we're you know constantly advocating to to, to push this some more public art forward the, the funding is there the money is there the you know the the options are there as far as you know where we can put these things um and we do want to make sure that we include um, you know, Blue Island artists as much as we possibly can, and you guys are at the top of that list, obviously. And um, you know, before I get back on prompter here, because I got to, I think we're about ready to wrap this up. Um, I just wanted to thank um, all of you guys. Um, you know, as a resident of Blue Island, um, Jason, like I said earlier, is somebody who was trying to come back. You know, to my hometown. I just want to thank you guys so much for um, everything that you've done, whether it's making us feel welcome here. Um, involving us in um, in so many of the institutions and um, and initiatives here, or being a part of um, you know those initiatives and, and, and helping see those through, um, they're just so important to not only to us but to this town um, as a whole because we are a very grassroots driven community to say the least, and uh, you know without people like you guys, um, you know we wouldn't be in the position we're in. So I just want to thank you guys. Uh, so much for what you do for Blue Island um, and the Calumet region. And uh, is there anything else you guys want to add or should I should I get back on prompter and, and wrap it up? Well, I'd like to thank you also for uh, for inviting us to participate in the mural. It was quite an honor, you know, and uh, I always love to see the community reaction to to the to the final product. Uh, the enthusiasm was, was beautiful to see. It's an important piece uh, of, of this town, that's for sure. Um, yeah, and thank you definitely, uh, uh, Kevin and Jason, for uh, you know just bringing us together tonight too. You know, it's it's really it's really well, it's really great to see everyone and hear everyone. Uh, but yeah, thank you again also for just you know the project you know that we got to work on together, and um, you know I, I had an amazing time working with Robert, Erica, and Ray. So thank you. Yeah, man. All right, I'm gonna get back on prompter here, like I said. Um, <laughs> all right, uh, before we close the session, I uh, just want to take a second to thank all of our attendees and panelists again on behalf of the Calumet Heritage Partnership Board. Uh, thank you to tonight's speakers and uh, to those who have shared their stories throughout the Calumet Heritage Conference, as tonight is the last night. And uh, also a big thank you to the moderators, uh, everyone that ran tech, the program committee, the CHP board, the Field Museum, Calumet Collaborative, and uh, Arcelor Middle. And last but not least, those of you that have made donations uh, or purchased CHA gear to support Calumet Heritage Partnership's work. We're gonna continue to see how the pandemic plays out into 2021, and we'll make an announcement at some point in the future regarding the structure of next year's conference. 
Um, check out Kelly Met Heritage Partnership's Facebook page tomorrow for a complete video library of this year's presentations and panel discussions. And we'll be posting these videos on the Kelly Met Heritage Partnership and Kelly Met Heritage Area websites soon as well. Uh, we hope to see everyone at next year's conference in whatever format that ends up being. And thank you again for your support of CHP. And with that, um, thanks again, everybody, for, for joining in. And uh, we will see you at the very least at next uh, at the next Kelly Met Heritage Partnership. Thank you. Conference. See you guys. Bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.